Cash Money Team. Uh, this whole series, we've been trying to help give you the guidance you need to glow up and increase your financial IQ. There's more to evolving as an entrepreneur than just listening to our podcast, of course. Though that's a great start that's for right. you. That's right. It's a great start and it's helping me too. That's right. So today, we want to introduce you to the three E's of entrepreneurship educate, explore, and empower. No matter how hard you hustle, if you try to do it all on your own, I always say this, you are working against yourself. This episode, we're going to talk about some of the ways that travel, conferences, classes, and education can help you accelerate your professional development. But first, let's do our accountability check-in. Woo woo! Amina, okay, come Account- on. A- accountability check-in since last time. My running shoes came in. They yes. feel really comfortable, and we are about to schedule some exercise together. Yeah, we've been talking about those ten thousand steps that you're doing. <laughs> I am hitting. I already hit my ten thousand steps, and it's not even two p.m. yet. All right, good. Well, you know, I've been doing the detox, so it's a two-week detox, and it has been hard. I've never done anything like this in my life, and one of my biggest problems has always been willpower so I wanted to make sure that I completed it and things actually turned out really well. Your skin looks beautiful. Thank you and you know besides some early on hiccups where I think eating is such a social thing for me yeah. like all the time I'm like oh we gotta meet up where should we go eat where should we do this where should we go have a drink so it was really weird for me to change my mindset and then a lot of times I realize I eat when I'm not even hungry you know, just because it's something to do or something's in the house. So I'm really glad that I did the detox and I highly recommend it. I can't. W- OK, I'm lying if I say I can't wait to do another one, but I'll probably do one again next year. So <sighs> we made it happen. Oh, man. I'm like, and thank you for walking with me also, because I know that we have a goal to start jogging together. But at least now while I was weak, I could walk. So that was good. Listen, we're going to get fit. We're getting fit mentally, physically, everything. Okay. Um, my other accountability check-in for you is that book stuff is coming along really well. Submitted a full proposal, uh, got feedback, and hopefully we'll be going on the market to sell it soon. We set a deadline for that as well. So You are moving. You have moving that. Moving along. You're about to be a host with, on TV. I'm excited. <laughs> You've been doing a lot, for real. Oh, my gosh. Um, you know, it's easier when there's somebody to check in with. Yeah, because if not, I'd have been like, all right, now you promise. Listen, I feel like I have to step it up now, so I will. Okay. I got to step it up. Okay, let's talk about the first E, education. Mm. So what's your educational journey been like, Angela? So I will say, and I really always am trying to make sure I go to schools and promote education to the kids because it's been one of the most beneficial things for me in many different ways. Mm -hmm. You know, I grew up in Brooklyn. I went to public school until sixth grade, but then I was in this program called Prep for Prep, where they actually send kids from like urban neighborhoods without money to private school. Yeah. So you have to test to get into it. There's like an IQ test, interviews, and then like some tests. And so only a few kids are chosen. So I was fortunate enough to get chosen to be in the program. And they basically prepare you so that you can do really well in school and go to college. So my whole life, I've always been trained, like at some point I'm going to college. And since I was young, I knew I wanted to major in English because I used to love to read and write. So even when I was like five years years old, six years old, I was like, I'm going to be a writer when I get older. So um, I went to private school from seventh grade to ninth grade. I went to poly prep in Brooklyn. Then I ended up going back to public school, but I, we moved to Jersey for two years. And then my parents sent me back to school <laughs> in Brooklyn because I was a bad kid. I was not focused. I was a straight A student, but I used to cut school a lot. And, Man. but I'll tell you something when I, I learned when I went to college I ended up going to Wesleyan University which was great in Middletown, Connecticut thank you I'm actually doing a TED Talks there in April yay that's awesome which I'm excited about but what was great about it for me was it was a small liberal arts school they had a great department for English and I met a lot of great people that later on in life have been really instrumental in me getting to where I got to in my career. A lot of great people went to my school and I advise anybody, make sure you use that career resource program that's available to you when you go to school. And, you know, you pay to go to class. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to miss all these classes that Mm -hmm. are paid for. And I was a lot better at attendance when I went there. And I really got to choose certain classes that were just interesting to me and helped me formulate what it was that I wanted to do later in life. So... Thus far, that's what my formal education journey has been. And then after you tell me yours, we'll talk about what we've done. That's not maybe a formal education, but the journey toward getting to where we are. 
Right. Um, I, for as long as I could remember as a kid, I was excited about going to college. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go to university. And I think that's just a drive that my parents put in me. But it just, it was like a far away goal that I was very excited about. I did. Um, I, so we lived in, uh, in West Africa and then in Europe. So like my education was all overseas. But when I was in high school, I asked my parents to go to boarding school <laughs> because I was like, uh, I was a very independent kid. So I was just like, oh, boarding school, that seems more academically rigorous than whatever's going on here. Even though I was going to very good, uh, I went to French school mm -hmm. um, when I was growing up because we're, uh, we're French speakers in my family. And, uh, but for boarding school, I knew I wanted to go, I wanted to live in America. When I was older, I was like, I want to go to an American university. So if I want to do that, I have to learn English and then I have to go to high school in English. I was That's like, amazing. this is what is going to set me up for that goal. My parents were like, first they were like, oh, hell no. Like, you're just trying to get away from us. Like, all of this stuff. <laughs> like, they school, knew. Then going to <laughs> they knew, right? And I was like, no, I just want a better, better education. Like, we, you know, it was just this thing where um, a lot of my family, like, lives in Europe and that kind of stuff. And my dad was one of the few, like, black men that I knew that had an office job, even though he wasn't the most educated person in our family, like he had gone to university too. But I just like, I don't know why, like from a really early age, I just noticed that like for like European black people, opportunities were more limited than American black people. Mm -hmm. And I had never been to America. So it was all a fantasy, right? I was like, I definitely saw like Cosby show and I was like, oh my God. Like, yeah, I was going to say, I don't life. know how true that is. No, I, I think that on some you level, on some level it is true. Okay. It is true. It's uh, when I look at like how my family has panned out all of us that like came to college in America um, it's not that we're smarter or better at the time that we did there were definitely more opportunities I mm -hmm. think that like some things are changing but um, it's also it's different it's but it was also like the fantasy of the American dream right where when you don't live here you think you know what the dream yeah, they is sold that. Uh, right and then you <laughs> no that it works just like Coca-Cola right. it works the thing is real but also I wanted to learn English it was a challenge that's what I wanted to do so when I was 15 I learned to speak English I went to this American school um, for boarding school. It was very stretching, and it was an American school in Nigeria, so it was really fun. I like still got to live in West Africa. I love Nigeria. That's where I consider a home to be for me, even though we're not Nigerian. But I, I learned so much in that boarding school environment of just being, um, like, we played a lot of sports. It was a very small private school, so everybody had to play sports, and you had to, like, academically achieve. Mm -hmm. And I think I learned just a lot about, like, being responsible for your own learning journey. And the thing that I was really lucky is that I've always been a very curious child. Like, from, I, like, taught myself how to read really young age. I loved reading. I love learning. And it just came from a place of curiosity. And I'm really lucky that my parents pushed that. For college, I wanted to go to like the American big college <laughs> university thing. I applied to 21 schools, got into wow. 20 of them, got into 20 of them, waitlisted at one. By the way, isn't that expensive? It is very Those expensive. Ask my dad about it. Ask my dad about it. This, 21 it was, schools? I know. And then I didn't know where I wanted to go because I was that kid. So I made him write like 20 checks for when you're supposed to send in your application. And he was like, you can only mail one of these. I'm like, I know. I'm going to destroy the other ones but it was really stressful but then in the um in the end after a crazy journey i ended up taking a semester off completely <laughs> uh because you know like right. european babies we do gap years and you get to learn stuff so and um, my family at the time was living in belgium so i decided to just like spend more time with them because i'd been at boarding school and i just noticed that my brother and sister who were younger were much closer to each other than they were to me and oh. i was like oh well that makes this sense. is a i was like this is like this is a thing like we are all close but it was like a thing i was mm -hmm. just like okay because I don't live here. Right, you, you weren't guys, there. Yeah, I wasn't there for like a lot of stuff. So I decided first I was like, I'm going to take a year off. Two months into my year off, I'm like six months. Mm -hmm. Like, it's cool. But uh, so I like got to spend time in Europe, like do things, be more with my family. And then I ended up going to the University of Texas at Austin. Hook em horns. <laughs> and uh, it's that. I was like, I wanted like big school Eight, right. like 100,000 people. I want my name to be a number, like all of that stuff. That's so interesting because I wanted the opposite. Man, and I wanted like a, you know, like a big football program, like just, you know, like with a great basketball team, all of this stuff. But the thing that happened is that I enrolled in the liberal arts um, school at Texas 
And UT is a really big school. Like our entire campus, like everything, like professors or whatever, I think covers around like 70,000 people. Ooh. They go out of their way to make it so small. I never had a class with more than 50 people in college. Right, like never. And uh, when I and when I got in, I enrolled in all these programs for people who uh, were either like first generation college students or like students that hadn't been through American university. So what happened is that I got to follow a cohort throughout college. So those people were my friends. I also joined a lot of clubs and uh, I like I had to work because I like my parents did not have any money to give me for school. And because I was an American, I also wasn't eligible to take out loans. So oh, I, man, that's yeah. That's crazy. I didn't even think about that. Oh yeah, I worked... Um, by the time I was a senior, I was working like 40 hours a week and taking a full load at the same time because I had to That's pay. That's two full-time jobs. Yeah, it was two full-time jobs. <laughs> and, you know, but like when you're a college student, you're also a little crazy. You just don't have a concept of time. And I was I was really lucky that I was able to have those opportunities. I tutored. I like in the summer, I had to work all the time because I just I'm like, if I want to live here, this is my dream. This is what I need to and do. And nothing for nothing. But that probably really helps you with your work ethic now. I think that's so important. When I was younger, I worked a lot, too. When yeah. I was at school. I didn't work 40 hours on campus, but I definitely had to have a job it was and the I had grind, student loans. You know? But, you know, in order for me to be able to eat or do anything, I had to have yeah. a job. So it was like a job that was working um, and going to classes. Yeah. But I do feel and doing and then I did a lot of internships, too, yep. when I was coming I home for the summer. Interned mm-hmm. all the time. And the other thing, too, is that like when I look back, especially on being in liberal arts, like now that I, you know, it's like I ended up working at a big tech company. Like I do all this computer stuff. I didn't learn any of that in college. And I think that there's such an impulse where people are like, you don't need university for X, Y, Z. And I graduated college in 2007. We were the last class before the recession. Half of my class, they had jobs when we graduated. I did not have a job and we just got lost in this global, terrible recession. But, you know, it's like I came out okay on the other end, but I'm not going to lie to you, 2007 to 2009 was like very rough. Mm -hmm. But the thing that I think college was really, really good for is that it teaches you... If you if you pull your weight, it teaches you how to network with people in a way that is not that like gross people always just asking you for things. It's like you you create a network, you know people, you get to like some of my professors I still keep in touch with. Right. And like that has been helpful throughout. It's like some of my friends, you encounter people in different ways. When I went to work at Google, um, one of the first things that the recruiter did is that she contacted other people in the company that had been around my class. And she was like, hey, do you know this person? We're thinking about hiring her. She's coming here. And like two of them, like very informally knew me. I had no idea they were at Google. And they were like, oh, yeah, no, this girl is cool. Like hire her. Like when you are trying out for like big jobs, like a lot of that stuff kind of happens. I have my alumni network is lit. Like we are, you know, it's like everybody from like Trevante Rhodes to uh, like so many Olympians and just like really and even just like very cool way older people that have helped me in my career. Anytime Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, like I'm thinking about doing this thing. If I go in my alumni group and I'm like, oh, um, oh, this person is a lawyer or this person is a in the industry that I want to get into. And I email them. People are really generous because you share that bond. You share that bond together. And then as you get older, you become that person. Like I'm mentoring two girls at UT right now. I love and I love seeing them, you know, hit me up like Lin-Manuel Miranda, who did Hamilton. He went to Wesleyan. Yes. Here's another a random person that went to Wesley and Bill Belichick. That's random. Yeah, but he went to Wesleyan too. But I think it's amazing. Like people are so. My best friend Santi Gold. She's an artist. She went to Wesleyan I love also. Santi Gold. Yeah. So we went to college together. Like, is I think it's great that even after school, there's been so many of my friends that have hired me as a consultant for yes, different things, yes. and not just because they're my friend, but because they know I'm capable of doing the work, and they know they can rely on me. They have a relationship with me outside of just a work environment. So in a way, people are more apt to want to kind of push you along and help you out. Using that word relationship is so important because I think a lot of people don't realize this is that starting from a very young age, but I think college starts to professionalize it. All of those people that you meet, you're going to see them in life again. Yes. Like you... 
If you don't like somebody, I guarantee you one day that like you're going to be in a room where you're having a meeting of something, that person is going to be there. Like your first internships, you're going to see that person again. You're going to and that's why you need to be conscious of a lot of time about having a strong work ethic. It's like don't let people down, don't miss deadlines, don't do these things because they have repercussions that like in the moment that you're doing them, it's maybe a big deal, but in the future it becomes an incredibly bigger deal. We had one internship at a record label and there were six people from Wesleyan that had the internship over the summer. By the end of it, I was the only one still coming to work. I was there like the first one every day, the last one to leave. Everybody from all the different departments knew me. I was interning in the legal department, but I would still like go talk to people in promotions and marketing and A&R. Yeah. Like, do you need any extra help? Yeah. And at the end of it, they were like, you are so incredible. You're the only person that's still coming here, is still working, still always in a great mm-hmm. mood. So it was really important to me to establish those relationships. I actually got two job offers when I graduated from college based off of my internships. Yeah. The other thing too in college, like, and if you're listening to the show and you're a college student, I would say is to really take advantage of all of the free resources on your campus. So many. My freshman year, I um, I got very, very depressed and it started kind of affecting going to class and a lot of stuff. I'd never been depressed before and at first I was like, I don't know what this is, but I'm just sleeping too much and I was missing all my classes. And my RA is who was like, uh, she's like, you should go talk to somebody. And I was very dismissive of it, but she was like, no, she's like, this is how it starts. She's like, a lot of freshmen deal with this or whatever. And I wanted to be lazy about it. And then I was like, no, I get free mental health for free yes. here. Why for free. You? Like you're actually, it's not free. You're paying for it. Mm-hmm. So you might as well use it. So it was like doing that, learn how to use your entire library system. Even if you're not, you know, like you think that you don't have to do research. It's you get all of that stuff for free. You get newspapers for free. Use all of the discounts the gym, that you Everything get. is free. Use the gym. Well, it's not free you're paying for it well, yeah. so use what you're paying it's for, paid for. Right? you already paid for <laughs> go it go to class but, by the way you paid for that too it's the last time that you're gonna get stuff like that for free you know like for a long time so really just take advantage of it and also the more you get to know your student resources the more you're gonna meet educators that are gonna want to help you now did you have a roommate so I um, I had roommates all of college. I lived on campus only the first year. And then after that, I moved off campus. We um, And at my university, that was like very common. But I, I lived walking distance from okay. school. So, And we had an open campus. Like there's not a gate or something where you're like, this is the university and this is not like we. It was like very, uh, it's like in this part of Austin and it's part of the city. So I lived my sophomore, freshman and senior year, I lived off campus. But like, I remember how cheap rent was. It was like my rent was, I paid the biggest rent. In my senior year, I, I was like, I'm going to ball out. And so I paid the most expensive rent of all of my friends. And I had the entire top floor of our house. Happy. And I paid $370. That was it. <laughs> but like all my roommates were outraged. They were like, that is too much money. Yeah, when I think about fun. how much money I pay in rent now, I want to scream. Can we go back to college? Woo! Yeah. And like, you know, food that you've already paid for and all that stuff. But I, I liked living off campus. I think that it also just like teaches you, you know, it's like you get to learn your city a little bit more. It just depends what your college uh, environment is. Yeah, like I know a lot of schools, if you're in the middle of nowhere, you got to stay on no, campus. No, at Wesleyan, we definitely pretty much all stayed on campus. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's a small town. So, you yeah. know, it was houses, though. So we exactly. had houses. So I think my I never wanted to have a roommate. So my freshman year on my application, I was like, oh, I'm really loud. I said all kinds of things so that I wouldn't have to have a roommate. <laughs> and then the second year, Santi was like, oh, we're going to um, let's live in the women of color house. Let's join the group That's and then cool. we can live in a house. So I ended up being the co-chair and she was like the treasurer or something <laughs> of the women of color collective on campus. So we had a nice house to live in and it was like six of us in one house. And then, yeah, it's just, I, listen, I know people who have had nightmare experiences with mm-hmm. roommates and I know people who have great experiences. Yeah. It just all depends. It all depends. It's all about communication and also speak up. I had a really bad roommate my the first semester of freshman year. In fact, I think the reason that I got that room is because her previous roommate had left. Ooh. And she she was a very nice girl, but she was so messy. Yeah, that's oh, a problem. Like she was so she was so messy. And you know, it's like we live in a small room and I would come back and she's like cooked all this garbage in the microwave. It was really, really bad. And finally, I just sat down with her and I was like listen I like you as a person but like I can't live like this this is rude and disrespectful you know and the other thing is that like I had gone to boarding school so living with people was not new for me but I think that you know it's like college is weird because Mm -hmm. 
you like have your own room at home and then you turn 18 and they're like share a room with somebody like that <laughs> does not make sense and a lot of people that's where they learn how to interact with people so for me I was like I'm sorry like I went to boarding school we would wake up at 6am and all make our beds and like clean you know like we had inspection in the morning so I'm like I cannot live experience. like this she didn't have that but it was really hard but by the end of it you know she tried and when she wasn't trying I went to talk to our RA I was like you just you have to speak up for yourself right. and you have to say instead of letting it fester because the that person is also learning how to be in community for and the first time. And you don't want time. to be inhaling moldy food. I know. It was just like, it was a lot. But, you know, shout out to that girl. She's doing great now. Now, aside from our formal education, of course, there's things that you do to further your education outside of college. Oh, my God. Or so grad school. Much. I watch so many talks on the Internet. If I like somebody or there's somebody I admire from an industry, I'll go on YouTube and I'm like, what talks have they done? I watch a lot of that. I also like to teach myself things. Like, that's how I learned how to code, honestly, was Mm -hmm. just like from going online. Because when I got to my first job, (laughs) I remember they were like, on the first day, they were like, write a press release. I got a liberal arts school. Like, I never, I've never encountered press release in my life. And I remember I went on Google and I was like, how to write a press release? I was like, you have all you the can tools. Find everything. You have all the tools. And I remember being so scared. I was like, they're going to fire me today. And then they didn't. And the girl was like, oh, this is good. Thanks, Google. You, yeah, I'm like, this is what college does for you is that even if you don't know how to do something, you know where to find all the answers. Right. So just, you know, and ask. If you don't know something, ask. There's such a fear to asking. But so I watch a lot of talks. I do that. And then as I, like started climbing my career I also in the same way that on campus I knew where every college resource was at work I went to my work and I was like hey I am new here I want to get better one day I want to be a manager I want to do all these things what like what can you do to help me do that and you know it's like they started sending me to conferences at one job I had they got me a coach like somebody who would like it's like half therapy half like professional encouragement And to do that, because being a manager is really hard. And I was a very young manager and I managed people that were way older than me. (laughs) So I had to, you know, like I had to learn all of that. But if you invest in your work and you show that you want to stay there, a lot of times they also want to invest in you. So... You just need to ask. If you don't ask, you won't know what's going on. No, yeah, absolutely right. And then there's certain things I do, like having opened a juice bar. I don't have any experience in like the food business. So mm-hmm. in order for me to get my food handler's license, you have to sign up for these classes. Yeah. They're pretty intense. And um, it's like six hour classes a day for a week in order to get that license. So that's something I felt like I needed to be able to do just in order to run my business more efficiently. I think there's nothing wrong. It's actually a great benefit to take these managerial classes and get different licenses because I'm in this business now that's new for me yeah. and I want to make sure that I excel at it and one way to excel is to always try to work toward mastering something exactly so that's why I've been doing that um I watch a lot of things also online with with what mm-hmm. I want to learn. Even for me doing radio, it was something I had never done before when I started doing radio. So in order for me That's to so do that... That's so crazy to me that there's a time that you weren't doing radio. Oh my gosh, yeah. I didn't know what I was doing. I started when I was 28. Wow. So I had no idea what I was doing. So it was something I really had to educate myself on. And so that was me watching documentaries, reading other people's biographies, autobiographies. Mm-hmm. I feel like that helped me a lot as well. And even for what I do for a living, trying to make sure I'm up on stuff, like I'm always researching things yeah. I'm always watching documentaries I'm always watching movies I'm making sure that I'm up on what we're going to be talking about yeah. I have to make sure that I'm constantly doing research but I do feel like the structure of taking a class like an, you could take an online class yeah there's resources like lynda.com mm-hmm. masterclass like you, there's so many ways that you can learn you could look up the local community college where you are I did that when I wanted to learn um, a little bit more about accounting right and like I'm not a good bookkeeper I could pay somebody to do it or I could try and my community college had a class that was so cheap and so I did that and now I'm like you know I'm not only an accountant one day but I know how to keep my own books yeah so that's one of the most important things no matter what always keep educating yourself always keep learning you never know everything it's important to know that you don't know and also don't be afraid to try something new I think a thing that I hear from a lot like I love you saying that you started radio when you were 28 you know I think I I didn't know that about you I Mm -hmm. really thought that's what you did right after college and when I think about what I wanted to be when I grew up and the first job that I had what I do now is so completely different right it's so completely different and I would have never had the imagination to be like here's what I like the thing that I'm doing now that's what I want to do but if you're somebody who's like you're driven by curiosity and instead of 
when you think like, you know, I don't know, you're you're watching a movie and you're like, oh, how do they make movies? Instead of saying I could never do that, it's like just look it up. Right. Look it up. It, Everybody starts from and then somewhere. You hear other people's stories and how they got into it, and you're like, that's amazing. Eva Duvernay, you're an excuse for yourself if exactly. you say I can't do that. Eva Duvernay used to be a publicist, and now she is like one of the biggest directors on the planet. You know, and so. You should just, you should have, you don't look at things from a place of fear. Look at them from a place of really expanding your imagination. And, you know, I think that like short of driving a rocket, like everybody can do anything. You can drive I was a rocket, like, girl. I know if they train me, but I don't have time for that. But, <laughs> you, you know, Google but, it. <laughs> but in the meantime, I'm just like, you can do, there's a way to learn everything. Like, it is. People are not smarter than you. They're Stop not like whatever. Stop talking yourself out of uh, pursuing your passion and your goals. And if you're going to be an entrepreneur, you have to do lifelong learning. <laughs> and sometimes you got to start back over from the bottom. And there's mm-hmm. nothing wrong with that. If you decide you want to switch careers, take a pay cut, you have to start back at the bottom. You got to humble yourself yourself and make it happen. Yeah, you know, so we also talked a lot about um, college, but the other thing that is true is that vocational training is also available to a lot of people. Like, we're, one thing that, that was, like, actually great about Europe is that they, you get to decide. So, you, like, went when you're I think it's like in at the end of high school they're just like what track do you want to be on and it's obviously very geared towards uh, uh, your grades come into this a lot but some people get to go to university some people go to vocational training and whatever and honestly like vocational training there's a ton of money in that too like you know like carpenters and plumbers are out here making way more money than we are are you (laughs) kidding me and so I think too that like if you're somebody who wants to learn like a technical skill like I don't know uh like, yeah, I'm going to use like carpent, like making, uh, making furniture, for example, or you want to learn manufacturing audio, or audio engineering. Yeah. Audio engineering, like these kind of specialized things, like there's training for that. And so um, for as much as we're like pushing college, like college is not the only way to learn. And it's frankly not the best way to learn. And some people um, don't benefit from it. The thing is that like whatever learning path you're on, you need to take full advantage of. Right. Period. There's no right way to say this is how you have to get educated, but make sure you get educated somehow, whether it's life experience, vocational school, college, grad school, whatever it is that you decide to do. Mm -hmm. And be around people who also want to learn. Like that's the other thing when I think when you're an entrepreneur, that's really big is that um, your peers are who motivate you. Like you see them doing things and you can ask them how to do that, learn how to do that. And that's the that's the thing about our community, right? If you don't know something, you probably know somebody who knows how to do it and they will they will help you through it. Okay, so the next E that we're discussing today is exploration, right? So a really very intuitive way to kind of change your own perspective and horizons is literally to go somewhere (laughs) different. Travel is really important. And it honestly will tie in back into your entrepreneurship in the sense that like the more you go out of your comfort zone, the more you're going to be able to have experiences that will broaden and enrich you. No, for myself, I have never traveled outside of my neighborhood until, well, the only place I went growing up was to Montserrat, where is an island in the West Indies where mm-hmm. my mom is from. But other than that, we've never taken any trips anywhere. So that was the only place I'd ever been until I went to college outside of New York and New Jersey. So it was weird for me when I went to college. um, One of my friends, her family had a timeshare in St. Martin. And that was the first trip I ever took, not with my family to where my grandfather lived, but like on a real vacation that was kind of like me and my girls. And we only had to pay, I think, $50 like cleanup fee for the actual timeshare. So we all went there. And it was really fun. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. Like, I'm, you know, a grown up on a trip with my friends. But I do regret that when I was younger, my parents, we didn't do things like they make fun of me all the time. I've never been to Disney World ever. Me neither. Do you want to go together? You think we'll have a good time? I don't know. So I've been to Euro Disney. I did not enjoy it. But Disney World seems intense in a different level. I feel like I have to bring a kid with me. No. But they said there's like adult Pe- stuff. People are getting engaged there all the time. It's all I see on their are Instagram you proposing page. To me? <laughs> I'm gonna propose to you at Disney World. Get ready. I'm gonna give you a ring so big your, your back is gonna hurt. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so you know, it was a weird experience for me. And then yeah. after that, I realized how important it is to travel. You know, I recently went and took my mom back to Montserrat like two years ago. She hadn't been there in like 20 years because we used to go all the time growing up. And then there were all these volcano eruptions. Mm -hmm. So you really couldn't go to the island. My grandfather had to leave. Everybody had to evacuate. So now I think there's only about like maybe 5,000 people that live on the whole island. But it was really nice to be able to 
relate to things that I grew up going to see and I didn't appreciate it as much as I do now. Yeah. When I was young, I didn't appreciate going to visit you know, where my mom and my whole mom's side of the family is from. But now when I go back, it's amazing to me because you see things so much differently as an adult than you did when you were a kid. But I also feel like it's really important to get outside of your comfort zone. Like you said, I remember having, when I was in college, I had this boyfriend and he had never left his neighborhood. You know, wow. he was from Jersey, never went anywhere. And then he went to come see me at college. And one day he said to me, you know what? I wish I would have seen this when I was younger growing up because maybe I would have felt like I wanted to go to college too because sometimes exposure to something is all that it takes for you to be inspired to yeah. want to do something bigger so even traveling I started working for Wu-Tang I worked for Eminem and I went on the road with them I went on the road with Eminem's clothing line going to different cities so that was exciting for me to be able to see how different it is I know I'm from New York so sometimes I'm so quick with everything I talk fast I want everything to happen really quickly mm -hmm. and even when I go to different cities I have to slow myself down and tell myself to relax yeah. I'm not used to people being friendly and polite and saying hello and greeting me just certain things when I was younger when I would travel like to see where my mom was from everybody was so nice polite laid back calm and I'm so hyper it actually made me adjust my thinking about having to just be nicer to people and slow slow myself down. Yeah, you know, I think for me, travel is a huge part of what made me who I am. Like we, I was really lucky that I grew up traveling. The first time I was on a plane, I was ten days old. So Sheesh. that's the that, that's <laughs> been that's been my whole life. My parents, like, we moved countries, we did stuff, and but you know, also like West African people, like we go far. Like when you go to university, you go really far, and. And it's like, I think about it now, like my, we were, we were not, yeah, we were not even, I wouldn't even call our family middle class when we were growing up. Like we were definitely not a comfortable middle class. We were definitely struggling for money. But my parents like always saved up so that we could take a big trip every two years. Like we always went on vacation. That's so we, you know, it's like, it would be like five of us in a hotel room or whatever, but we like, we're seeing Paris. We're like doing all these things. And I think that that's a value that both of my parents had that um, it, I was really, I got to see a huge chunk of the world when I was young. And as I got older, when I was young, I didn't appreciate it at all because everybody around me was right. doing the same thing. You don't thing. appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, it wasn't until I moved here and um, and when I started, like, especially meeting a lot of my African-American friends, I was like, oh, you don't have a passport. You don't. That was, like, very foreign to mm -hmm. me. But then you, like, learn about Jim Crow and you're like, oh, there are, like, structural racist reasons for why everything happens. And then I learn about... Um, the um I learned about like so much of what like restricted travel in this country and um you know and there's like the green travelers book that people would use literally as a resource to tell each other like where it was safe to go and all that stuff but I and I think a lot of times like when people talk about travel they don't realize what a huge privilege it is and how much money it is but for me the privilege that that gave me is that from a and I traveled a lot even alone as a kid like unaccompanied minor my parents would ship us back and forth That's that way crazy. That... yeah the first time I went on a plane alone I'm pretty sure I was 11 and so it's like doing customs going to the airport like I knew how to do that like from a to really yes. from a really young age and even now with my friends I notice that I'm that person I'm like give me all the passports That's how I am now because like, I travel I, so much now give me all the you know it's like I like I'm the one that knows how to navigate that but that's because like as a child I always had that and even and then when I went in call into college I got to do that with my friends but also then I got to explore the United States which is so big I never live in a country this big <laughs> and so that you know like it's like road trips and all of that was really fun but as an like as an adult now I Traveling is part of my DNA. I think that it makes me a better person. It makes me a more compassionate person. And I think, too, that for women, it's really important to travel alone. You think so? Because I think so, because all of the narrative of, like, adventure and all this stuff, it's so, like, like men get to go, but it's scary for us if we go somewhere alone. Right? I don't even like to and be alone like that when I travel. I know, That's but I think part of what it is. You I, should you should, t you should really challenge yourself to take a trip alone. You're going to learn so much about yourself. Like, I fly alone, but when I get places, I know people. No. I love going somewhere where I've never met anybody before and you just get to live like a local because it kind of makes me feel like a kid. I like going places also where I don't know the language at all. I like I speak five languages, but when I go somewhere where I can't read or I can't, it just like humbles me in a way where I'm like, you know, like 
there are a lot of people who live here who feel that way. Like they can't navigate cities and we're so like especially in America like everything is fast we expect everybody to speak English everybody does everything I'm so glad you said and that and you're like the rest of the world is not like when this when I first went to Europe when we were on tour and you know you leave and everybody speaks a different language yeah. you could be going an hour away and you're like oh they speak a different language here because you're in Germany exactly and, you know you, you're just going you're going to France you're going you to all that. these different places and everybody's speaking different languages and you're like wow this is so and we expect them to know English exactly and they do every you can they do. live in Europe and not speak a lick of a European language anywhere. Somebody will assist you in English. That's true almost everywhere. But English speakers are very selfish. You go to Italy. It's like you go different places. People Everybody always... knows English and we expect them to know English. Yeah. And I do feel like we need to take more time to understand a culture before we go and make yeah. an effort. And I totally agree with that. I remember just going to... Madrid with the guys and trying to order pizza and I think in the pizza place they didn't speak English that yeah. well but I had to make sure there was no pork because I was with Wu-Tang <laughs> so I was really trying to stress like how to say that like yeah. <laughs> you know but I think that that's, that's also like part of learning like people are always so impressed that I speak so many languages I'm like actually it's not impressive at all for where I come from my grandma's never been to school a day in her life she speaks more languages than me because we're you know, like we come from like trader, like tribes and they just you interact with so many people. But the thing is that like learning a language is a skill that everybody can have. Mm-hmm. You can do that. It exercises a different part of your brain. But also I find that it's, you know, it's like if you're saying that you want to like build a business and you want to be an entrepreneur or whatever, you are so limiting yourself if you don't think of the entire world as your market. Right. You know, and so you're just like, how do, like, that's the stuff that I think about all the time. I'm just like, oh, like, how do people in France work out? How do people in, like, how does this work in Africa? I have a friend who runs, like, a really good travel business, and she takes people around the world. And you just see the joy and the, like, everything that people get. And you're like, yeah, because this is also education. You're learning, and you, you're you expanding your imagination. You're learning new things. And because because you don't know everything, like all of the answers to everything in the world are don't are not in the United States. If you go somewhere else, you're like, oh, these people do this thing much more efficiently or they understand this other thing better. And you can incorporate all of that in your life. Even when you're dating somebody, some of the best things that you can do together are travel. Mm-hmm. That's how you really get to know somebody when you get to travel with them and have that experience because those experiences are lifelong presence. Like I love when we do destination things instead of just giving me a present, I'd rather we do something together. Yeah, no, I love that. I hosted an entire podcast on travel that you can listen to. Um, And the thing about it that was great, honestly, was talking to just so many women who were, everybody has their own travel tips, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing that I really enjoy. All of my friends that travel a lot, I always ask them, I'm like, what's your one travel advice? And I always learn some new shit, uh, (laughs) some new stuff. Well, let's talk about some things that are our own travel tips because myself, you know, I travel a lot for work. And so in order to reward myself, I use those points that I get. I always try Gotta to make do sure the travel rewards. I try to make sure I travel on the same airline as frequently as possible so that I can get a certain type of status as a member of that uh, whatever Sky Miles program that they have. Mm-hmm. So I do that. And then I like to use those points to reward myself with a vacation or a trip or something like that. Also, even being able to upgrade when you have a certain status on certain airlines, it's easier to upgrade. I get to mm-hmm. upgrade like to economy me comfort for free sometimes I get upgraded to first class for free so that's great and it's really important to check back sometimes you can upgrade and pay to upgrade to first class and it might be like $20 more than what your ticket was but it's always worth checking to see what will it be for me to upgrade instead of just waiting to the last minute and settling because sometimes when I travel places they book our flight and a flight in first class might be just about almost the same price as what they pay for a regular economy seat so it's just good to check all of those things out also I get to the airport really early. I um I'm not about that life. I'm so I'm a, about that life. I don't this is why also I like traveling with people, but I am like I'm responsible for my own getting to the airport. I'm like I I like to do my own thing, but I'm also like a very efficient traveler. I'm like I got TSA pre, I got global entry, like I know. Yes. And I've been doing it my whole life that I know exactly when I need to get to the airport in order not to and miss TSA a flight. TSA pre-check is a great thing to get if you don't have that. Make sure you I sign up for I that. I can't date program. somebody who doesn't have TSA pre-check. I will leave them. I'm I'll like, see you I'm another sorry, side. If they don't have pre-check or they don't have global 
whole entry, I'm like, this is, <laughs> this is really, I'm like, I don't know. Like, we are not going to be happy at this airport. But the reason I get to the airport early is because I do like to take my time. Anything can go wrong. So you yeah. never know how crowded is it going to be? Is there any issues? Is there a problem with my ticket? Is, True. So all those things, I don't like to be rushed when I get to the airport. I like to be able to take my time. So I give myself a padding of time. And then because of my status from flying on the same airline, I get to go in the Sky Club. Yeah, all the and lounges. I can sit down and, you know, have some tea, have a little snack, relax for a minute because I don't like having to rush. And sometimes things have happened going to the airport where your flight gets delayed or canceled and then you could have gotten on another flight if you would have gotten there earlier True. and known what happened. So it's just important. You just need to, yeah, you need to just honor your own self and do that. One of the, so a lot of people always say that like travel is really expensive. And my answer to them is that just like education, it's an investment in yourself. Mm -hmm. So if it matters to you, you will find ways to make it work. One of my favorite, favorite things to do is to look up all of the error fair websites that there are. So error fairs are basically every, um, Every once in a while, <laughs> somebody enters the information wrong right. on a... $2. Exactly. Like, the <laughs> flight is, like, $100 to Iceland. I bought a flight for $111 to Iceland from New York. But you have to, like, stay on top of these websites. There are a bunch of them. Uh, you can Google them. The one that I like, like, they have a Twitter handle, and I just... Um, <laughs> I just like look at the tweets all day and I'm like, oh, do I have time to go to Barcelona for $200? Why not? That's amazing. And so the the thing is that like you have to be flexible. You 100% have to be flexible because you're going to be flying, you know, like you're going to be flying airlines sometimes that you've never heard of. And you also just have to have the time. But the reason that I like doing that for myself is that uh, it's like a great way to just like discover places I've never been to. Like I went, um, God, where did I go? Oh, I went to Martinique for $170 from wow. New York over the holidays and it was so nice it's like the, there was nothing to shout home about the flight but I was like I I'm spent, I'm like I've spent $170 <laughs> in New York from my couch doing absolutely nothing so the fact that I was able to do that you know and then it's like I got to spend like five days on the beach it was do like, layovers bother you because I know a lot of times layovers, layovers might have a cheaper flight but so it, I prefer layovers, a direct flight I prefer a direct flight if I can hack it but I'm also for as much as I travel I'm going to tell you a secret I'm the most nervous flyer you know so it's like I'm always like meditating and like medicating myself and all of these things like I'm going to Australia in May and I'm very that's a long flight how I long know, is that flight um that flight is so long that they don't make a plane that does a direct flight right, from New York to, to Sydney. You mm -hmm. have to have a layover. So in those cases, I love layovers because I'm just like, okay, I get to get out. I stretch, stretch my legs. Eat. I can, yeah, and just like, you know, and the layover is in LA. So I'm thinking, I'm like, oh, maybe I'll just go a day early and then mm -hmm. I can I can do that. So I like, I don't mind layovers. I just don't like them to be inconvenient. I don't want like a seven hour layover. But if the layover <laughs> is an hour, I never check a bag. I have not checked a bag since before Barack Obama was president. Like, I don't wow. Wow, I don't know how you do that because um, I always end up having to check a bag. I sometimes I ship stuff to myself, and uh, like if I like See, if I, I, like, I feel like anything could go wrong with that. Uh, not at UPS where they have tracking numbers for everything. <laughs> if the thing goes wrong, it's somebody else. But that's the other thing about traveling too is that you just have to be flexible. Like I've gotten places where my luggage didn't get there or something. Like if they put it in the cargo hold, it didn't get there. And instead of just being mad, I'm like, this is this yeah, is the whole Yeah, you can't get point. mad because there's nothing you can do about it. You know, to quote a great poet, how are you going to be mad on vacation? <laughs> <laughs> and that's another okay. tip I will give you is don't be rude to the people working at the counter or the people on the plane because they have a lot of power over you. They can be very helpful or they can be very detrimental to your they, trip. They can, but I think you that can, like, I've seen people get kicked off. I've been with people who have gotten kicked off the plane for being rude to the attendant, which I felt like was very extreme. I'm just saying, when you travel, just make sure you keep it calm, get to your destination where you have to go. If you have any issues, deal with it after, but you don't want to have those holdups. It's also this... The, the whole point of traveling is that you're challenging yourself and you're going out of your comfort zone. I'm not saying that you have to be like uncomfortable and like all of the stuff. But I think that the one thing that it will teach you is how to deal with a crisis. Right. And also when you travel with someone, like for me, it tells me everything about my partner, how they travel. I'm just like, <laughs> if you cannot hang with like being a little bit late or being you know, flexible like, exactly being flexible or making plans or you know like in the same way where if you're at a restaurant and somebody is rude to a waitress like I feel that way about people who are rude to flight attendants right I'm like their job is really Awful. hard they have to do so much emotional labor just to like make you happy we're flying in a tin can in the sky um, you know and so just keeping your cool and whatever 
is like that's so important because you'll go to places where like the culture is very different everything is much slower or it's much faster or whatever and again it just like gives you compassion for all of your neighbors who are immigrants or like people who just are not from here and you have to learn how to deal with it it's like that's it's like it's a very important part of getting through life. I totally feel like people who have all kinds of stereotypes and biases against other people, it's because they don't know those people and haven't traveled yep. outside of their little bubble. So that's why it is important to and make sure also, we travel. It's also an assumption that like the way that you live life is the best way. And I think mm-hmm. that when you travel, it teaches you that there are many other ways to just be and that you can be happy with less or that you can be happy with uh, more in a different way. And... You're not going to be a successful business person if you cannot get out of that mindset that you know everything. Now, are you a resort type of person or are you like a go on an excursions type of person? I'm going on a resort for the first time in my life uh, (laughs) in a couple of weeks. I'm going to Negril. I will admit that uh, I'm not a resort person at all. I used to turn my nose up at that kind of stuff. Uh, because I'm just like, I want to explore and rugged and I like to do my own thing. And also I want to meet locals. But... I saw this hotel and I'm like, yeah, all I want is like five days of doing nothing. So like resort is going to do that for me. But at the same time, you know, like you get what you pay for. So the resort is nice and everything, but I'm not going to learn anything about Negril or the people of Jamaica from like hanging out at this place. But you can also leave the resort though. See now, I'm No, this resort is all inclusive, including food. I am not not leaving leaving for five days. I'm a big fan (laughs) of going to a resort and actually leaving the resort when I feel like it. But the reason why I usually go on vacation is because I'm exhausted from work and I need to take a break and have some downtime and just relax. So that's why I'm a big resort person because it's so much easier. There's times when I've done things where we've rented a house or we didn't stay on a resort and it's a lot more effort as far as figuring out how are we going to eat? What are we going to eat? It's not as easy as when you stay on a resort and everything's just available to you and you can sleep in and go to the pool and relax, go to the beach. But I do like to go to a resort and then leave that resort and do daytime excursions. The other thing that I will say, too, is that, like, I travel a lot in groups, but that's because I pick the groups myself. (laughs) At this point, like, I know every single one of my friends that I want to go on a trip on. And some people are my really good friend. And I'm like, you pay me a billion dollars. I'm not going anywhere outside of Brooklyn with you because (laughs) you're a nightmare. Is that the other thing that it forces you to do is that you need to have, like, real conversations about money with your friends, too, right? Because, um... Like all of this, st- like the point of traveling in a group is that stuff is cheaper, right? But if the person unless is planning, you're paying for everything, exactly, like me. unless you're the one that pays for everything, <laughs> or you know, like I've also been like in a group with friends where I was the person that was making the least money. My friend knew this, but everything that she picked was really expensive, and I was like, I can't afford this. But I feel that like if you all make rules, it's almost like you're challenging yourselves. So you're like, here's how much money we're willing to spend on a hotel. Here's how much money we're willing to spend on food, and then it becomes like a puzzle that you're trying to solve, and it makes every everybody honest you know like and I think it's really rude to go on a trip if you have absolutely no money to and expect yeah, other people to pay for things exactly. for you then don't go if you just don't have it like that or unless it's somebody that's like look I got you for everything be cognizant of that don't say okay I really want to come I don't have any money but I'm just going to go right. and they'll take care of me that's just rude you it's have to rude. make sure that you're still mindful of what other people's situations are also also the person who plans a trip gets the nicer room that's just the rule so <laughs> don't be fighting over air Airbnbs if you have not put in the work to make the trip happen. That's how those are the rules. <laughs> and traveling in groups is all about compromise too. Mm-hmm. Sometimes as a group you guys all want to do something. Sometimes you just have to compromise. Maybe it's not what you necessarily felt like doing but because everyone's going, don't be the person that kind of breaks up the fun for everyone. And you might try it and have a good time. You never yeah. know. And it's Yeah, again, it's all about communication, right? If you're just like, okay, like some of us want to do this stuff. The other ones of us want to do something else. You just have to be honest about it and just talk it out. And I'm always the planner. Is that like being controlling? But I am always the person that plans everything. I plan. I'm always the planner. And that's because my schedule is probably the, the, the worst. The least flexible, yeah. yeah. So I'm always like, we're going to go from this day to this day. We're going to go here. Here's, And then I'll get my flight. And then you guys do your stuff on your own. If you come with me, fine. If you don't, it's so whatever. But I'm going to pick the dates we're going. I'm going to pick where we're staying. I'm going to book my flight, send all the information out, and you guys move accordingly. Yeah, I just, it's really funny. I'm the planner on all my trips, like everything from like the flight down to the activities. 
But I think one, it's because I'm the one that's traveled the most. And also two, because I give a lot of options. I'm not somebody who I'm like, here's the itinerary that we're doing. I'm just like, every day I'm going to give you three do it, options. Yeah. If you want to do a thing. I also don't mind splitting up from groups. So if you're just going to go somewhere else, we can, uh, yeah, we can figure that out. Uh, but anyway, long story short, exploration is good for everybody. So we hope to see all of your travel suggestions. Open your and like mind. travel destinations. Open your passport. Exactly. On our hashtag, live colorful with two L's. The next E we're discussing is empowerment. So attending conferences, joining a professional development group, all of that stuff is like really, really great ways to network. And you learn more about your industry and really just like help make the connections that are going to propel you forward in your chosen career. Yeah, the great thing about that is people are there for that same purpose. So you don't have to feel awkward about approaching anybody about mm -hmm. anything. That's what they're there for. And... You also are in a room with some like-minded people or at a conference with like-minded people. So there's a lot more probability that you'll get something accomplished. Yeah, I um, I am really lucky that I'm part of a couple of groups that really facilitate a lot of stuff for me. I founded something called the Tech Lady Mafia. That's basically just an organization that um, it provides more opportunities for women in tech. The group has grown really big. Now we're encouraging people to find other groups to join because the thing, too, about networking groups is that the bigger they get, the diminishing <laughs> returns, like really said. But if you're like a woman in tech, there's so many of these groups that you can join. And just like even asking your coworkers about them is great. For podcasting, we have a group called Ladio for like women in, in audio. And we get to like share resources together and we like help each other on everything from like salary negotiating to just like job opportunities and the thing that's really good about all of this these things is that like we have meetings in person but a lot of times it happens online so you don't have to be in the same city as everyone really to feel like you're getting a benefit out of them but like you know and I've mentioned before like I'm really active in my alumni group like I consider that to be like a solid foundation that I have and a lot of groups that I was in college like I was not in a sorority but um, I was um, in a lot of like volunteer groups and things mm -hmm. like that and we like keep and in a leadership group that we it's been I think I graduated college over 10 years ago now but I still keep in touch with all of those people and I found work that way I have found opportunities that way I found I found apartments that way it's you know it's just like you can you can use these connections to just basically figure out whatever it is that you want to do. One thing that's been really beneficial to me, I've been trying to learn more about investing in finances. Mm -hmm. So I actually started this event called Wealth Wednesdays that meets once a month and it's at the juice bar and we bring different experts in every single month just to educate people on different ways to invest. And also just financial education, relationships and finances. Also, uh, if you want to figure out how you can save for your kids, is college education. There's ways to do that. It talks about millennials and money. State Farm was part of that one that we did. And Google came in. I know you used to work at Google yeah. just to talk about different ways you can use Google to help grow your business. And just things like that, you know, that are really beneficial for everyday life. How can I invest my money? What should I be doing to start my own business? How are some ways that I can talk about money with my partner? What are some things to do that I can make sure that I'm set up for the future? Because that's something I felt like I always was lacking in. So that's what made me decide to start something like that. Yeah. You know, like one thing that I always complained about when I was really early in my career is that I couldn't find a mentor. And I like everybody that I worked with would say the same thing. And then one day we realized, well, actually, like, you know, like finding a mentor is hard. Like we I'm going to keep looking for one. But the truth is that we can also mentor each other. Mm -hmm. You know, like we have all the skills. And then I started looking at like everybody who was kind of in my own, you know, like they were in the same boat than I was, like whether they were at my job or they were just in my industry, other places as a resource that like I could use. So we started informally meeting. We would help each other. And, you know, the thing that was really good about that, I think, especially for women, is that there's just like people always say that like women don't help each other. And that's not true at all. Not true like, at all. It's so not true or they'll say like, oh, if there's only two black people at this job, they won't get together or whatever. All of that stuff is not true. And I have found that like when I was generous to people, that stuff came back to me like 10,000 fold. Like I, when I was like the bottom of the ladder and I didn't know what I wanted to do, I would email someone and be like, hey, how did you get to do what you want to do? Or how can I go to this conference? Or how can I do that? People really showed up for me and they don't owe you that. If they don't do it, don't be annoyed because they literally don't owe it to you. But if somebody like gives you even five minutes of their time. That's a blessing. 
Amazing. It like maximizes for all you can. And the more that you climb in the ladder, the more you should be doing that for other people. I try to set up office hours um, that I do every couple of weeks for people who are just like younger in the industry who mm-hmm. want to learn from me. If you email me, I will try to get back to you in timely manner. And... You know, it's like just lean on your own peers. There's not going to be there's not enough like older people to mentor all of us that's going to work. And to be fair, now that I'm becoming older, too, I'm like, oh, they don't also don't have it all figured out. Like everybody wants a mentor. (laughs) Everybody wants somebody to teach them. But if you can look at your own friends and be like, what can we teach each other and how can we carry each other forward? That's really going to help you. And we have some examples of professional development groups that we can give you, mm-hmm. too. You know, obviously, you talked about your tech lady mafia. Mm-hmm. Um, Busy Girls, that's a platform for young female entrepreneurs. They want to start a business, open an online store, post original music, share inventions, and more. So they have this whole Busy Girls Entrepreneur Program, which is a series of summer camps, after school, and weekend programs. They've helped over 2,000 girls from ages 7 to 14 start their own business. Yeah, you. they're like really, especially like if you're in tech, like we said, there's so many great groups like Black Girls Code, who was started by Kimberly Bryan, who's one of my heroes, and I'm so lucky to know her. And she just runs a group that like empowers girls of colors like 7 to 17 to become innovators in STEM. So if you have like a little sister or a little cousin or somebody, you know, like Kimberly's group is literally telling them that they can be scientists, they can be engineers, they can do whatever they want and they can have fun doing it. There's a, a group called Women Who Code for uh, for those of us who are not 7 to 17. And uh, Women Who Code like has so many resources to help you how to learn coding, but also how to expand your leadership skills, your networking, and like getting recognition from your industry peers. They also have a great job board and a database for scholarships and free tickets to conferences. So again, like if you're in STEM, these groups that we mentioned are really good, but just do do a deep Google and right. there will always be a professional group. Start your, your own career. group, by the yeah. way. And if there's not one, that's what Tech Lady Mafia is. We started our yeah, own group because own group. I hadn't looked for these other groups. And uh, did double the work for nothing. Right. I just joined one of them. (laughs) Even somebody who I look up to, MC Light, she has her own thing with Dr. Lynn Richardson, who co-wrote the book, Your Man and Your Money, How to Get Them and How to Keep Them. They have this annual empowerment conference for female entrepreneurs. It's called the Wealth Experience in Miami. And it's all about cultural issues, financial empowerment, health and wellness, mentorship, educational opportunities. It's a three-night event. So things like that, I think, are really important for us. Yeah. And then there's things like the Female Founders Camp in Austin, in um, here uh, in New York, WNYC started hosting uh, Work It, which is a festival for women podcasters. This is the third year, I believe. I've been to all three of them. You know, the thing is that, like, just find a conference mm-hmm. that, like, m- meets your needs. And yes, like these conferences all cost money. Like we're not going to lie to you. Uh, They all cost money. But again, it's about investing in yourself, right? So the first line that you can do for when you want to go to a conference is to ask your job if they will send you, Mm -hmm. if it fits in with your professional goals. The first time that I went to South by Southwest, I convinced my boss that I needed to be there both for like because our clients were going to be there and also I wanted to learn. Now, um, I've been back to South by Southwest like more times than I can count and every time I'm a speaker so when you speak you get to go for free basically right. like you have to pay for your own flight and accommodation but the conference ticket is free the other thing is that some of these groups that we mentioned earlier will also give you scholarships free tickets you need to ask and you need to hustle and see what the deal is you can also like a lot of these conferences you can volunteer to work yeah if you volunteer you can do that um, if you um, say that you have a need like don't ever let like being shy about like talking about your financial situation like stop you from going to these things I was invited to a conference at Harvard one time and I was like I don't I can't pay for the train ticket I can't pay to stay there and I told the organizer and she was like oh we have scholarships for that we don't really advertise yeah, it, them but they're there it so, does not hurt to ask but, and again you can do that and I definitely feel like you can also people need people to come work so part yep. of you coming there to work is you get to meet the people behind the scenes and you get to attend the conference because you're there working I mean the Revolt Music Conference they hire a whole bunch of people to come work for that I've actually helped people get those jobs to go work at the Revolt Music Conference and it's just a good place to be in the room and there's so many powerful people speaking on those panels who you can actually talk to. You know, don't be shy to go up to people and ask them questions and ask them if you can keep in contact, if they have an assistant or an email address. Nothing wrong with that. That's how things get done. Yeah, and part of your own like career development for yourself is that like all of the conference, if you go regularly to a conference you should challenge yourself to pitch a talk so that next time you can speak. Like you don't need to be in the audience for 
for like five years in a row. You need to be somebody who is now like a thought leader and an industry leader like where you are. And you also have knowledge to share with people because that's the other part of networking, right? You can't just ask. You have to have something to give back. And sometimes you can't do that immediately, but the people will be more open to helping you if you can also solve a problem for them. So that should always be a goal that you have. I mean, I know when I'm at the Revolt Music Conference, we have to go to that every year because our morning shows on Revolt every day. And whenever I go there, I anticipate that people are going to be coming up to me and talking to me. I just ask that you have it together. You stand out somehow and know that sometimes it might not be us having a full half hour conversation. It might be a situation where you have to follow up later, but I have no problem with actually talking to people there. I've kept in contact with people that I've met at the Revolt Music Conference and just make sure you follow up afterward. But you definitely can't approach me because if I'm there, that's what I'm there for. I'm not there for you to not speak to me. There's thousands of people. Yeah, you know, and this is true also for if you're like doing email, like you're asking somebody for advice, you need to be really precise in what you're asking for, right? Like you can't say, mm-hmm. how do I get to become right. you? But if you say like, hey, um, do you need, Angela help with anything? Yee, do I you can need like I like Angela, Yee, I saw that there is an internship at XYZ place and you work there. Is there a way that I can send you my resume and you can you have to do the work? Yeah, you have to do to the work really personal so that I feel like I want to speak to you. Exactly. No information about me. You can say something to me that will make me say, oh, this person really made sure they went and did their homework. They actually might be really good for something because exactly. I can tell by how professionally they approach exactly. me. Exactly. You have to be precise in your ask and it has to be a realistic ask and it has to be something that like we can deal with in the moment but yeah and if you stand out a lot of times like that's also a sign of your hustle and people will be attracted to wanting to know what's going on with you colorful lives presented by state farm to help you increase your financial iq and to bring your career business and life to the next level Every other week, we're getting together and offering up advice and inspiration to help you up your financial IQ with our new season of Colorful Lives. If you're liking what you're hearing, we'd love it if you could rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, SoundCloud, or Spotify. It only takes a few seconds, and it makes a huge difference in helping more people find out about the show. And if you really want to support the show, we're not asking for any handouts. We just ask that you put a friend on to your favorite episode. So don't forget, you can get into the conversation on social media just use the hashtag hashtag live colorful with two l's at the end of colorful all right so we are now three episodes deep into our colorful lives video profile series now in the most recent installment on statefarm.com slash live colorful that's with two l's at the end of colorful we introduce you to melissa butler who runs the lip bar in the d in detroit oh uh, oh uh. Hello. (laughs) Hi. Thank you guys so much for having me. I really appreciate it. We're so impressed by your business and I love the colors that you have. Thank you. Thank you. We on this episode, we talk so much about empowerment um, Mm -hmm. and what is more empowering than trying to challenge the beauty standard. Right. And helping empower all women to feel beautiful. Right. And literally that's, that's our mission. That's been my reason from starting day one. And literally it's why I work hard every day. I always tell people I'm not passionate about makeup, but I am passionate about making women feel beautiful and letting them know that they are enough. And we do that really through representation. Now you also had a a nice cushy corporate job, but on the sides you were making these uh, lipsticks in your kitchen. Yeah, I started my career on Wall Street. So I didn't come from a beauty background. I didn't grow up playing in makeup, um, but I decided to jump into the makeup industry because I was frustrated. I hated the lack of diversity. I hated that most cosmetics were filled with unnecessary chemicals. So literally, I would work on Wall Street 60 hours a week, come home, make lipstick in my kitchen so that I can have like these colors that were out of the box or these colors that suited my skin tone without compromising my health. And then it it became like a real business. And today we actually just announced our target launch. So I'm super hyped right now. That's what I'm talking about. Um, You had an experience on Shark Tank. Like, can you tell us a little bit more about it and what your takeaway was? So we went on Shark Tank maybe three years ago. So the business was still like, we were still super small. I had just quit my job. And our goal in going on Shark Tank was really just to air. Because I mean, like 7 million people watched the show. Right. But when wow. we went on there, they were so cruel to us. Like, 
it was so mean. And like in that moment, it's very easy to to decide to just stop because public defeat and like public rejection is a big deal. It's embarrassing. But I decided to kept to keep going because ultimately I was like, okay, they don't first of all, they're not my customer. They don't <laughs> understand True. They, they don't understand my business. And like the reason why I started, it was such a strong why I had such a, a purpose that I was like, I'm not gonna allow them you know, to, to allow me to stop what I'm doing just because they said no. Like, who the F are they? They and don't control my life. And that's actually a great story because sometimes people just aren't going to get it. And they're not yeah. going to understand your story. And if it's something that you're passionate about and you really believe in and you know you can make it happen and you have a plan, then I don't think that somebody not believing in that plan should deter you. Exactly. Exactly. And so that's a decision that you have to make and and it's going to be hard. So when Shark Tank first came on, I did not watch it. I didn't want to watch it. I didn't know what they were going to show because we filmed with them for probably an hour and 20 minutes. But what you see is only eight minutes. So they're like chopping and screwing it to make it good for TV, which I get it. I mean, ultimately, it's a TV show, but I didn't want to watch it. But it ultimately ended up being like the best thing for my business. They have just aired it like 15 times now. They aired it on Black Friday. What a present. Um, and then it just came back on last week. So, I mean, I'm, I'm super grateful for the experience. And it created a whole community of people who just wanted to rally, rally behind us, believe in us. Um, and it was just, it's crazy exposure. And truthfully, maybe things would have went differently for your company if they had decided to get involved. Maybe it wouldn't have worked out the way that Lip Bar has. Right, exactly. Because, I mean, we've changed a lot in that three-year period. Like, we've grown in a big way. Now, Detroit is one of my absolute favorite cities. So you got to tell me what attracted you to Detroit to open your business as an entrepreneur. So I'm originally from Detroit. I grew up in Detroit. Like Detroit is my heart. But I started the lit bar when I was living in New York. I was living in Brooklyn, making lipstick in my kitchen, working on Wall Street. And for years, Detroit just had such a bad reputation. It was like, oh, Detroit, it's a city of ruins and it's so dangerous. But I'm from there and I never really felt like I was in danger. I never really felt like it was unsafe. And so I think it was like 2013 and you start hearing the story of Detroit change. It's like going from like Detroit and it's it's abandoned city to um, Detroit being like the comeback kid. Mm -hmm. So at the end of 2014, top of 2015, I just just decided to come back home. And I mean, honestly, there was no other place I would rather grow my business. My initial goal was to build a manufacturing facility. And I mean, Detroit built, you know, middle-class America through manufacturing. So what other place would I possibly want to manufacture than home? And the people are just awesome. Like the people from Detroit are hustlers. Like we work hard and we get what we want. Yeah. And it's a beautiful space that you have, too. So I know right now it's like investing back into where you're from and letting everybody in the city see, look, I am an entrepreneur and I still want to be here in my city where I'm from. Yeah, exactly. And there's so many dope entrepreneurs here. And I love that about the city. Like I know exactly like the people who own the nail salon that I go to, like I go to the 10 where I work out, live cycle delight. Like I know Amina. Um, so I love that it's this small business community of people just supporting each other. And you can't really get that in other cities. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about, um, how much money you had saved when you opened your business and how you were thinking about funding yourself until, um, until, you know, like a big break came. I started the lit bar just saving money from my job. And I think I started it with maybe $9,000 that I had saved. And when I quit my job, it wasn't because the lit bar was making so much money. It was just because I decided that if I wanted my business to give me 100%, I had to give it 100%. So I saved up maybe like nine months or what I thought would be nine months of like runway for me to live. I think I ran out in six (laughs) (laughs) and it was just a matter of like, okay, well you just got to figure it out. You got to get it done. So since I quit my corporate job, I've never worked for anyone else. And it was just like a matter of deciding to like make it work every single day. And like, even till this day, we still don't have 
investors. We've bootstrapped, which is crazy to like get in, get a, get a target deal, you know, with bootstrapping and just reinvesting into the company. But I think that just speaks to like our ability to really grow and connect with our customer. And I think even just uh, connecting to the customers as far as what we want, I don't like using products that have all kinds of ingredients in it that I can't pronounce and I don't know what it is that could be harmful to me. So that's really foreshadowing what is to come because a lot of people feel like that. Yeah. But you know what? In 2012, it wasn't like that. Right. We had to like convince customers like, yeah, no, I promise it's okay. It's vegan and and cruelty free. But yes, it will still work. It was a matter of like educating the consumer because they thought that if it was natural, that it wouldn't work or it wouldn't be like a bold enough color or, you know, that it would just be a crappy product. And now you see the, the customer's mindset change where they now prefer natural or vegan or organic products. You but were, it wasn't always like that. For yeah, sure. you were really ahead of your time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and, you're, and you're really challenging, you know, like the entire beauty standard, which is, it's you know, that's a, it's a really, really big goal, right? So um, how, um, how have you been like thinking about that? And what have the challenges been for you? And how are you seeing things change? So I think about it in a couple of ways. Of course, it's through our ingredients. But then aside from that, most of my competitors that have like awesome ingredients or that are natural or use organic oils, they're like double our price point. So I could decide to sell my lipstick for $28 like a lot of our organic or vegan competitors. But at the same time, is that product accessible? So like we challenge it in the way where it's like, yeah, your beauty shouldn't compromise your health, but also it should be accessible. Like having responsibly made products shouldn't be only for the privileged. So like that's a big thing and that's a big part of it. So no, our margins aren't as big, but we get to make up in volume and we really get to make a difference in the community. And then for me, it's like, I grew up questioning my beauty often. And so I felt like I didn't necessarily have representation within the beauty industry that validated my beauty. So I want to make sure that no matter what photo shoot it is, no matter what color we're producing, that it speaks to a wide spectrum of women because representation matters. If, if the world is saying beauty looks like one specific thing and you don't look like that thing, then how are you supposed to feel? So we create super diverse imagery um, just to like showcase beauty in in a variety of lights. What do you think that you know now from having started your own business, being an entrepreneur that you wish you would have known back then? Some of the challenges that you had, like, man, if I would have known back then, I would have did this differently. (laughs) Uh, It's a few things. If I would have known that influencer marketing would have blown up so fast, First of all, I would have worked with influencers earlier on, but also I would have just become an influencer mm-hmm. yeah. because influencer, influencer marketing drives beauty purchases. And so now when you're late to the game and like the big guys are trying to price you out because like Maybelline and Revlon, they're like, you know what? I'm going to take my money out of traditional media and print media and I'm just going to pay an influencer. Right. And so now when we reach out to like a YouTuber, like, hey, do you want to <laughs> try our product? They're like, uh, 50K a, a YouTube video. And we're like, <laughs> yeah, can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> And so I wish I would have known the power of influencer marketing earlier on. Okay. Um, this is great. Can you tell us where we can check out the lip bar online? So you can find the lip bar on at the lip bar.com at target.com and, um, and select target stores across the country. Perfect. Thank you so much. This was so informative, Melissa. And you know, I'm always Thanks, in Detroit. Ladies. So next time I'm in yes. Detroit, I'm going to make sure I'll come check you out. I know. Please, we, we have a store and like you can come and play and we can do your makeup and all that jazz. Oh all my right. God, we'll be there. <laughs> all right, ladies. Thank you. Have a good one. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. That's all the time we've got this week. Thanks again to the folks at State Farm for making all of this happen and to our guest, Melissa Butler. Of course, we want to hear from you about your favorite travel trips, travel stories, and conference suggestions. As always, you can join in the conversation. Just use that hashtag, hashtag live colorful with two L's at the end, or you can leave us a voicemail on our colorful lifeline. Oh, that's cute. Colorful lifeline (laughs) at 646-580-0576. Check back in in two weeks when we'll be talking all about the self-employment side of the hustle. 
We're also getting into how to find that side hustle and how to take it to the next level. And we give advice to all the freelancers out there. We'll also hear from Ayana Angel, host of Switch, Pivot, or Quit podcast. She's a former NBA publicist who left the league to find her passion and start her own business. And don't forget, we want to make sure you are a part of the show. You can write us at colorfulliespod at gmail.com. There's two L's in full. So that's colorful with two L's, livespod at gmail.com or text or leave a voicemail at 646-580-0576. That's 646-580-0576 or use the hashtag, hashtag live colorful with two L's at the end of colorful. Colorful Lives presented by State Farm is a loudspeaker studio production. Colorful Lives is produced by Matt Raz, executive producer Chris Morrow. Our engineer and editor is Dwayne Crawford. They're so lovely. For more information on Colorful Lives and other loudspeaker shows, follow at LSN Podcast on Twitter or Loudspeakers Network on Facebook and Instagram. 